Our moderator this morning is David Rothkopf. He's a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Endow Endowment for International Peace, where he has written um, Running the World, the Inside Story of the National Security Council and the Architects of American Power and Superclass, the Global Power Elite and the World. Our first speaker is Dr. Corey Shockey, a research fellow at the Hoover Institution and an associate professor of international security at the United States Military Academy. Next, we have Dr. Stuart Patrick, who's a senior fellow and director of the Program on International Institutions and Global Governance at the Council on Foreign Relations. And finally, Para Khanna is a senior research fellow at the New America Foundation and the author of A Second World, Empires and Influence in a New Global Order. Please help me welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. We've got a great panel. Uh, it covers virtually every issue that there is in the world today. Um, but fortunately for all of you, we have insights and solutions, both. So take notes, and by the time we're done, you should be in, in great shape to just go home. Uh, uh, in any event, We've, we've, got, we've got great folks, and what our plan is, is we're going to go through a couple of rounds of questions and then open it up to you as soon as possible so that we can really cover what's on your mind as early as possible. So please think about what you want to ask uh, and get involved as early as you possibly can. Um, there's sort of two parts to the title of this discussion. One is new rules and new system. The other is America's role within the context of that world. And I'm going to be very literal minded and I'm going to take it in just that way. And so naturally the first question that comes to the mind of this particular skeptic is, are there new rules? Is there a new system? So Corey, why don't you, uh, why don't you start us there? I'm not sure there are new rules, but I do think there is, there are, got it, okay. So uh, I do think the rules are changing in important ways because of the way that globalization is affecting state power. But I think a lot of people overstate the extent of the change. States still have the ability to set boundaries about immigration, capital flows, important things that affect the shape of society. So I do think the rules are new, but they're not as much new as the general discourse suggests. Do you agree? Are you nodding because you agree? Yeah, I, I would say that you know at, at the um, at the outset of the Obama. This is going to be the shortest panel of your day. <laughs> <laughs> there are no new rules. No, no, there's, there is not there's a, a new little, system. A little, Everybody go home. That's right. Yeah. No, well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll inject a little bit of I'll okay. inject a little bit of difference here. Um, you know, there ha there have been um, some changes uh, over the past uh, two years partly as a result of the global uh, financial crisis uh, and as a result of uh, a, a sense that uh, after uh, a period where the United States did not appear, or was not perceived to be as interested in multilateral cooperation, that um, there's a new dedication to uh, multilateral engagement. Um, we've seen um, We've seen a number of changes uh, in, in, in rules governing the global financial system, in particular uh, um, creations of uh, new regulatory mechanisms, et cetera, uh, changes in, uh, in the nature of uh, what the International Monetary Fund does, in, uh, in the balance of power within some of the international financial institutions. However, I would agree by and large with, uh, with Corey that um, the fundamental reform that a lot of people expected um, at, uh, at the outset of the Obama administration when people sort of thought of a new Bretton Woods moment or a new present at the creation moment, uh, we haven't really seen that and I think there are a number of different reasons for that and one of them um, is that um, it's just very diff difficult uh, when you have an existing order and institutions to sort of rejigger uh, the sort of sense of influence or what the basic ground rules are. I do think, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to come back to this, that one of the big challenges for the United States uh, going forward is to try to integrate um, rising powers, uh, particularly China, but also countries like India and Brazil, uh, which sometimes come to some of these global issues with a very different mindset, whether we're talking about trade, nuclear nonproliferation, or human rights. And so I think that's going to be one of the enduring challenges we face going forward. Well, let, let, me, let me follow up on these two questions before I go on to uh, Prague. If you, if you look at the lay of the land right now, um, the, this is way too hot. Uh, if I can fix that. Um, 
<laughs> I'm, I, right. <laughs> I may not be that technical, but um, uh, but in it, this was even a Jewish boy from New Jersey could fix the microphone. Um, uh, in, in any event, the uh, if you look at the lay of the land, we're not in the bipolar world of the Cold War. We're not really in the unipolar world of the, the, the maybe 15 or 20 years after. We're into something new. It's multipolar. Uh, we're not in the world of the G7. We're moving into the world of the G20, at least. Um, we're not in the world where the center of intellectual or economic gravity is over the Atlantic. It's now over the Pacific. Uh, we're in a world in which nuclear capability is spreading to new places. We're in a world in which asymmetric conflict give leverage to new places. So a lot of things are different. And I'm just, you know, there's a tug of war always between inertia and what's new. Are we actually just, it's, it's not that we don't have new rules and new systems, but we're on the verge of some new rules and some new systems? Do we think that there are major changes that are gonna stand in contrast to what we've seen? So maybe let's just go back to you guys and then I'm gonna come to Prague because I know that you think it's all actually very, very old rules, but I will get to that in one second. I agree with your judgment that it, it's messy and it's difficult to see the pattern. And I also agree with Stuart's point that, that the rules are, are breaking down to some extent. I mean, the, the predictability of state interaction. But again, I don't mean to, I don't mean to be a one-trick pony, but it does seem to me that the rules were always overstated. I mean, if you look at, at the management of the NATO alliance, presumably the place where American hegemony was most predominant, this was always difficult. It was always a struggle. It's, you know, the European uh, pipeline agreement with the Soviets in the 1970s. Like, it's difficult. We overstate a golden age in which rules governed things and, and things worked predictably and easily. Okay. Yeah, I'm Can trying I, to make a case that there are some new rules coming. It, and you, I mean, I, I think that what, what's difficult is, um, is that we've inherited a, a, a slew of international institutions that were created for a different order and aren't particularly adept at solving some of the major problems that we found, find today. Um, so that we have NATO, but I think part of the, and NATO is working on its new strategic concept now. And, you know, people joke at the Pentagon, you know, NATO, keep the dream alive. Because it, it's really hard to know what, you know, we're not waiting. I'm known for its great sense, yeah, of, great, great sense of humor, exactly. Uh, but, but it's, uh, you, you know, what is its rationale uh, in, in the world ahead? And during the Cold War, at least there was some solidarity between the United States and its allies, for instance, on what uh, NATO's role is. That now is up for grabs. The United Nations, um, one of the interesting conversations over the last year has been, uh, what's interesting is this within the walls of the United Nations. Wow, are we still relevant at all anymore? You remember when George W. Bush in 2002 went to the United Nations and said, prove your relevance by dealing with Iraq. Whatever one thinks about the way that war uh, unfolded, um, he was trying to suggest that it, and perhaps its relevance was uh, declining. And, uh, and what's interesting, people inside the institution are asking those very same questions. We live in a much more fluid environment where there are, are rising powers who are clamoring for, um, for, for a role. They, they want to change some of the, roles of the rules of the global trading system. They're pushing the envelope on issues of currency and the dollar's role in the world, and perhaps that's going to come up for grabs. Um, there are the, the non nuclear non-proliferation treaty regime, as uh, David suggested, is under extreme stress. We need to have new rules, but the problem is that there's so much institutional inertia built into what we have already that it's hard to know uh, where those are going to be coming from. Okay. So, Prague, you, you've written a terrific book which looks at the rise of the second world and, and, t and talks about some fundamental changes that are taking place. You've got another book coming out which is going to look at this from another angle. Presumably, you must be more in the school that there's some new rules coming, right? I'm very much of that school. Um, you know, we can't, we wouldn't be talking about new rules and new systems and the need for them if we didn't have a new order. Therefore, I think it's beyond dispute that we are entering a new order of some kind, or primarily first a disorder. And you know, the the unipolar world is is I would argue is, uh, is, is very rapidly shifting towards a multipolar one. And that, you know, let's go back to what order means. Order doesn't mean is America on top or is someone else on top. Order is an analytical question. What, what is the distribution of power in the world, irrespective of who is uh, 
who sits on top of the hierarchy. And the distribution of power is in fact dissipating, changing very rapidly. That's why we talk about rising powers. That's why we can also talk about uh, multinational corporations, non-state actors, transnational threats. All of that diffusion means that we are moving towards something of a, uh, something that is more unpredictable and somewhat more disorderly than what we've had so far. So you can't even talk about a system until you appreciate, or a new system, until you appreciate just how quickly the order that we think we knew and think we may even still have is crumbling. Uh, and, that, and then think about what new system might come in the pipeline. The system that we seem to be talking about is this multilateral system, uh, the United Nations and associated institutions, or if you're really up, up to the moment, then you'll talk about the G8 or the G20. Well, even that doesn't quite gra capture this new set of powers, new set of players that even the non-state actors that are out there. So you can't really talk about that G20 system as if it somehow re reflects this new order. It doesn't. It doesn't take into account all the actors, it doesn't take into account all the kinds of power, it doesn't even take into account all the different issues that are on the agenda. And then you get to rules for that system which have to be negotiated in light of all of those new players, but a lot of them aren't even at the table. So we're just at the very first phase of a very long period of renegotiating uh, where the order lies, who has the power, what kind of system can possibly capture it, and what kinds of rules that system may have. It's day one, and the answer isn't the G20. Well, but let's, let's follow that up a second, because there have been periods in history where the system has changed, but the rules haven't. And typically what happens in those systems is disequilibrium, tumult, conflict, the 30 years war, World War I, World War II. These things happened because powers rose up, new conflicts came, and there was no system for resolving disputes effectively or providing stability on an ongoing basis. Do you think we're in one of those periods? I think, I think we are very much in one of those periods, and I, I think that it's best likened to the Middle Ages, a time approximately a thousand years ago. That was actually a period of history where we in, in the Western world I think of it very much as synonymous with the Dark Ages in Europe, but it was actually a time when China, India, the Arab Islamic world all sort of flourished. Uh, and they were, each could call their own shots on the regional level. And that's kind of what the world actually looks like today. Uh, we can't really boss each other around as much as we thought, as much as America has thought that it could. Uh, because you look today at, at the rise of China and India and, uh, and, and powers in the Middle East and so forth. So I think it's actually a very useful analogy. That world then is multipolar or apolar. And I think that that's a, a much more accurate characterization of where we are right now. And yes, therefore, it means that we don't, again, have a, a security council which represents those power centers, and therefore, they all come together and, and negotiate uh, their differences. Uh, things are very much handled ad hoc and according to cultural principles and, and, and local rules uh, that, that may not derive from international law. Now, I know you want to jump in, but can I pose a question uh, even, even before you do? It, you know, we, we talk about the G20, and you know, that's a step forward. We're two years into that, and so far the G20 can't really agree to anything meaningful. The Treasury ministers, finance ministers just met, they sort of said, well, you know, it's kind of the Rodney King approach to world finance, which can't we all get along here? Um, and not, you know, any signing up to anything particularly serious. But the G20 only deals, as Prague implied, with economic issues. And when you look at the security structures, a lot of those big players that we talk a lot about rising up, the Chinese, the Indians, some of these others, they don't want to play in that game. NATO it struggled to go out of theater into Afghanistan, and they don't want to stay there. They want to come back home, and Europe can't get together a foreign policy. Isn't there a particular void in this era in terms of security structures? No, I don't think there's a particular void in this era because I think that's always been the case. Um, I think we overestimate the extent to which the United Nations was ever all that helpful in managing all of our problems. I think we overestimate the extent to which NATO was always helpful in managing all of our problems. I mean, if you think about President Eisenhower and John Foster Dulles in 1954 talking about the NATO idea possibly run its course, or the Suez crisis in which we refuse to help two of our allies in a war they're fighting. This is always a lot dicier, and I think one of the 
risks uh, big intellectuals run in talking about it is, is seeing systemic patterns and thinking institutions affect more than they do. Seems to me there's a lot more continuity in this conversation, even Parag, than your comments suggest um, about the medieval model because it, it seems to me a state's what has always been true, even in that high watermark of systemic cooperation, the post-World War II American age, is that it's always the roll your sleeves up hard work of one government persuading another government what it wants to do on security, on economics, on trade deals. It, the individual adds up to something greater than itself, but the systemic order doesn't remove the responsibility of individual states working and managing their interests. Yeah. I think there's a constant tension throughout history between disequilibrium and equilibrium and you, you, you never get to absolute on either side. Sometimes you have a little more equilibrium and sometimes you have a little more disequilibrium. But Stuart, I want to pose a specific question to you about this. You talked a little bit about the rise of emerging powers. We've seen an example of the new role emerging powers might play recently with Iran where the Brazilians and the Turks got together and they tried to cut a deal and were immediately, and by immediately I mean within about an hour and ten minutes, undercut by Washington that was really uncomfortable with you know, a plan B, with an, you know, a diplomatic avenue that didn't go through Washington. Is this you know, a sign of, of, of a, a coming series of problems that we're going to have or a set of issues we've got to grapple with? Yeah, sure, Dave. I think that it is. I think it, what's interesting, if you look, uh, as many of you probably have, at the Obama's, uh, Obama administration's national security strategy the, that was released this spring, one of the main themes that it has uh, in that document is the importance of integrating rising powers as, uh, they don't use the phrase responsible stakeholders as the Bush administration did for China, but in effect, that's what they're saying. Let's bring these countries into the tent and therefore they will embrace this sort of Western or established liberal international order that's, that, uh, that we've come to take for granted since 1945. I think what um, uh, the gambit uh, that uh, Turkey and Brazil uh, made uh showed very quickly the, the United States, uh, the Obama administration, that uh, other countries have their own ideas about, uh, for instance, uh, the, 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 the situations that would, that would require Security Council action, what they would be prepared themselves to, to countenance. Um, and, uh, and I think they were taken by surprise. I think the administration was, was clumsy in this regard in how it handled it, certainly diplomatically clumsy, because uh, they should have probably tried to co a little bit more to co-op these two countries. Um, but I think that it's, a, it's uh, in a way, the shape of things to come. I, I would disagree a little bit with Corey in the sense that um, I think there are elements of continuity, yes, but I think that to answer David's question, I think the world does risk being a little bit out of balance, more than a little bit out of balance on the security front. I think that you've seen great adjustments um, with respect to uh, moving from the G8 to the G20. You've seen some uh, adjustment within the international financial institutions, even actually a couple weeks ago in, um, in Korea in terms of readjusting some of the, the weight within uh, the World Bank and the IMF. Um, but in the Security Council, I, th I think that it is problematic. I, it's not necessarily dangerous in the short or even medium term that the Security Council does not reflect the world as it exists today. But the fact that it does not have India and Brazil and arguably uh, Japan and Germany at the same time is problematic when you think historically. I do not think that compared... The, the Security Council doesn't work very well, and not having those countries in it makes it illegitimate. Right. Well, they, it, 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 it appears as illegitimate. It also may, under, just at a practical level, those countries will not invest in the United Nations in terms of actual resource commitments as much as we would like if they are not inside that body. Now, there is a question, particularly with the big emerging developing countries who want to free ride, um, they do tend to want a free ride, and they say, hey, we're, we're developing countries. We're poor. We can't make those sorts of contributions. Like China, by China. With $2 trillion in the bank. Right, exactly. With $2 trillion. But if you talk to the Chinese, I this wish is... I was there. Yeah, right, exactly. Right. We all wish we were this poor. But this is a constant refrain, as you know, when you speak to the Chinese that, you know, wow, on a per capita basis, we're really still a very poor country. And you hear some of the same things from the Indians and from the Brazilians. And at some stage, these countries have to decide, am I a card-carrying member of the non line movement in the group of 77, the big develop the developing countries, or am I in the inner sanctum ready to pull my own weight? Well, that, that raises an interesting question, Prague. You know, we talk about multipolar world, and a lot of the time we talk about that, there's a bit of an admonition built in, which is, calm down, United States of America, you're playing too big a role in this, we need to balance things out. But there's another component to it, which we, 
we don't hear perhaps as much of in the United States, which is grow up the rest of you. The Europeans don't pull their weight. The Chinese don't pull their weight. The Indians don't pull their weight. Um, and you know, give you a perfect example of, of, we have a whole host of issues in the Middle East, and for the first time ever, China is central to those issues. There is no way you get Iran to back off of its plan unless there's pressure from China. China's central in Pakistan. China's central in Central Asia. And they don't seem to want to help out. They don't seem to want to take a stance on terrorism. They don't want to take a stance on weapons of mass destruction. They, is that sustainable? Um, and, and, and what are the consequences? I, I know you've like, followed very closely Afghanistan. You might want to take that as a, as a particular illustration of the roles of these emerging powers and where it's going to play out. Well, let's talk about this question of they don't take a stance. They actually do take a stance. Not taking a stance or laying low uh, is very much a stance. And Afghanistan is a great example. You can go to the Chinese and say, can you help us out in Afghanistan or in Pakistan? And what does that mean? Does that mean that they have to sign on to our end vision of what that place should look like? If they don't, then that doesn't mean that they're not doing something. Well, they seem to be they're willing to mine the lithium in Afghanistan, well, exactly. should they? And that, and that is very much what their long-term goal is. But the notion that another state is not uh, playing a global role just because it's not supporting our vision is, uh, is actually not, not exactly compatible. Uh, they're doing a lot of things. Uh, if China's vision, for example, with uh, the role that it's played in nuclear proliferation around the region is to say, well, you know, the United States is, is, uh, is going to be bogged down in this part of the world uh, and around the world for a very long time, and we're going to let them expend their energies and gradually uh, withdraw and retreat in some way, and then we'll be able to move in and have more influence. And that's what's happening. In, and uh, Patrick mentioned earlier countries that have a mind of their own. And to me, all of these so-called second world countries, these middle tier countries, these rising powers, do precisely that. But you see the, that ambition play out first and foremost on the regional level. So at the same time that you see Brazil being very active in climate and trade debates and even with respect to uh, diplomacy with, uh, with Iran, they are also building a much stronger uh, presence in the region and a leadership role in the region, building regional institutions. You see this happening with Europe's own sort of self-absorbed focus on itself, though it has widened and deepened at the same time and has grown to have 27 member countries in it. Even the African Union is, again, at really early stages. Uh, China has been working on developing developing both the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which has a very strong role in Central Asia, as well as this East Asian Community, East Asian Summit type of arrangement. So when we look, when we jump straight from the national level to the global level, we miss this entire set of activities going on that are extremely important. And regions are becoming very self-absorbed. They want to manage the rela their own relations with their neighbors rather than have it be mediated from the outside. And I think that shows really how, if countries like China and like Brazil and like India can become leaders in their own part of the world, then you're going to see them more confidently step outward and start to negotiate some of these global issues more. I don't disagree with Parag um, in that, but it seems to me that you underestimate the difficulty of them getting from where they are uh, to their vision of where they'd like to be. Take China, for example. I, I agree with your description. It looks to me like what the Chinese strategy is to free ride on the existing system, allow the United States to expend all of the systemic energy, pick off opportunities where you can, cheating on the Iran sanctions, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's a terrific near-term approach. It maximizes their prospects. But it's less clear to me that's a successful long-term approach. Because if you are not investing in making the world a better place and helping the Afghans through their difficulties, eventually the law of gravity applies to China as it does to us. And if I were advising the Chinese government, I would have them read the history of United Fruit in Honduras and Central America because their basic approach to places they are investing looks a lot like American multinational corporations in the 1890s and that didn't work out so politically successfully for us as we tried to establish our role in the world. I think there are a lot more difficulties associated with what they are trying to pull off than we sometimes uh, freight them with. Well, let's, let's talk about that and then I, I do want to open it up to you folks so think about your questions. So I'm going to ask one last round of questions here about America, and then I want to do that. But maybe the Chinese are very canny. In fact, 
any country that's grown for 30 or 40 years at 6 or 7 percent a year and has risen as rapidly as they've written is, is certainly very canny and they've avoided a lot of pitfalls along the way. One of the things they're best at is figuring just how far they can get in a negotiation without giving anything up. They're, they're, they're really good at that. And one of the ploys that a lot of these countries have been using is, well, let's, you know, it's, it's kind of like that old commercial you remember, you know, let's let Mikey eat it, you know, you know and, and, and they think, well, let's let the United States eat it. You know, let's let the United States take care of solving these problems, carrying the weight on security, doing these kind of things. And that seems like a pretty good strategy because thus far, the United States has stepped up. And terrorism's a global problem, but we were the ones to, you know, that took it upon ourselves and I think not entirely successfully uh, managed an effort to go after it. Uh, we, you know, we've gone into some regional issues. And, 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 and we're paying the price for this, which is a huge, you know, what is it, $2.7 billion a week in Afghanistan or whatever it is. We're, we're paying a lot of money to do these things, and they're free riders. How long can that go on? And more importantly, and Stuart, let me turn this to you, how long can we go on playing the role that we've been playing? Or do we have to figure out some new burden-sharing calculus, um, or we're just going to go bust or, or perhaps more accurately go more bust than we already are. Well, there's no question that, um, that the domestic political dynamic and domestic f fiscal situation in the United States um, would suggest that the grand strategy that we pursue in, the, in going forward is going to be a little less grand, um, as one of my colleagues, Charlie Kupchin, likes to say. I think that... Um, it's I th nice of you to give him credit. There we go. Well, I know it's, a, it's rare in this town, but I'm going to do it. But uh, I, I think that, you know, we... There's obviously a commission that's been set up that's going to uh, release its report um, next month on uh, on a, a presidentially appointed commission on on how to ensure a more fiscally sustainable future uh, for the United States. But uh, you know, obviously, a lot of the election returns that occurred uh, on uh, on Tuesday were about restoring some sense of uh, financial balance, um, and I think that some of that. Uh, well, they were about. They were. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I couldn't make out what they were yeah, about, there, really. There's, a, what, there's it was one, an element of, of, uh, of the Tea Party movement, shall I say. But, uh, so I don't want to exaggerate too much on, on reading into exactly what the message of that was. But I think that um, the Congress that we will be facing will be uh, quite attuned to um, issues of uh, federal spending, not least in, uh, in foreign aid spending, uh, and uh, what we call in this town the 150 account, which is basically the international affairs account. I think that people are going to be looking at that, and even the defense budget, uh, notwithstanding the fact that Republicans have traditionally been quite uh, strong proponents of the defense budget, is going to have to be looked at. All of that suggests that we are going to be moving uh, not into necessarily an isolationist or total retrenchment mode, but there are going to be con real constraints on what the United States can do. So, you know, the United States, you know, I don't know if you would call it the Vietnam Doctrine, uh, or, uh, which, uh, uh, or the Nixon Doctrine, I guess, which, which during the, towards the tail end of the Vietnam War, uh, Nixon sort of started looking around to some regional players and allies to maybe pick up a little bit more of the burden. I think we're going to start to see partnerships with India, for instance, on how to bring order to the Indian Ocean and, and, that, and that part of the world, uh, trying to look at different regional anchors where we can find them and where we are pretty confident they'll do things that we'd like to do um, uh, to try to pick up some of the slack. Uh, again, I don't see iso true isolationism, but certainly a major sense amongst the American public that we're exhausted, uh, we've been spending a lot of money abroad, and we want to maybe, uh, to the degree we're investing, we might want to be doing that at home. Well, let's take one specific example from this week, and then we're going to go to you guys for questions. Prague, the president, you know, is doing what people do after they've had a rough few weeks, road trip, you know. Um, and, and so, you know, he's going to go to Korea, and he's going to go to Indonesia, and he's going to go to Japan, and then he's going to go to India. And this India relationship's very interesting because we talk a lot about China. India talks a lot about China. India is the counterbalance to China. Uh, India is, we share certain kinds of cultural democratic heritage, and yet embracing India is a little bit tough because we've also embraced Pakistan and they don't get along so well. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, what, he's facing a conundrum that seems to me to be illustrative of a whole family of conundrums that are associated with what we've been talking about here. And I was just wondering what you think, is how that's going to play out. And the most fundamental of those
those conundrums is us having to realize that, uh, in following on, on what Patrick said, it's not about the U.S. needing to find regional anchors to carry weight for it. Uh, it's really about those countries rising and deciding what they want to do and what role they want to play, and hopefully uh, there's some synergy there. But we're not really able to compel them as much. During the period when the United States viewed India as this very important counterbalance to uh, China, uh, merging in the region, uh, India really wasn't looking at China in that way. Uh, they were actually trying to boost trade uh, and actually having all of these summits with China where they would declare a multipolar world is coming and China and India together are going to uh, usher in that era. So it was not exactly the message that America wanted to hear. Now things have changed a little bit and India wants to be much more of a naval power straddling the Indian Ocean. The fourth largest navy in the world. Exactly. And, and that is something that they see much more as their role. So they didn't really play along with the U.S. in terms of this, uh, oh yes, it seems so Manichaean and simple on a map. The U.S. and India and Japan and Australia will balance China. It hasn't really worked out that way. Uh, India is, is seeing itself much more, again, uh, having this, this central presence uh, overseeing the, 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 the growing density of, uh, of commerce and trade between the Middle East and the Far East, and that's the role that's much more appropriate for it. If the United States wants to be a part of India playing that role, India welcomes that help. But it's not the way I think you, know, you were sort of phrasing it, which is, ah, America would like to see stability and, and, uh, you know, in, in these sea lanes and therefore let us sponsor India's rise. India sees itself much more centrally, I think, uh, in that picture. And then you can apply that to every other such rising power in the world. It's not the United States wants to help Brazil r rise and become a... No. Yeah, Brazil sees itself as the America of South America. It, it's... Um, mm -hmm. Right. And I don't think this is a new development. I think India has viewed itself in those terms for a long period of time. It's not, it's not the sun rising anew. You know, where, it, where the tension comes is what should their agenda be? What should their priorities be? Should they sign on to the IAEA uh, you know, uh, uh, sanctions on Iran or not? Should they, should they stop exporting refined petroleum to Iran? If they don't see it in their interest to do that, the, they won't. The point, the point is the countries have always viewed themselves that way. There is a tension that you talk about. There's also an opportunity because the opportunity is that the United States is more willing to go along with that uh, th than, they, than they have been in the past. and so. You know, the, but it's different in each case. And I think one of the mistakes that we can make in this is to say, oh, well, here are the BRICs, and the BRICs behave monolithically because the BRICs are very different, not in terms of their own individual goals. India doesn't get along so well with anybody in its neighborhood. Brazil does, but frankly views its neighborhood as a ghetto and wants to play on in the international stage. Russia has a whole different set of views. China has a whole different set of views. So all of these countries pull in different directions. Anyway, are you standing because you have a lower back trouble? Um, or because you've got a question? All right. All right, just waiting for the questions is all. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, first off, I'm Rich McBride from Peoria, Illinois. Uh, so that puts things in reference. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Go on, go on. You hate the heartland of America. Obviously. No, no I'm, I'm just very conscious of where I stand at the moment. Okay. <laughs> at any rate, um, if I could talk about some of the key words I'm hearing in, in uh, this panel discussion. Number one, rules, rules, rules. New mic. Okay. So I'm hearing rules, rules, rules. And I've heard institutional inertia. Now yesterday we heard a great deal about strategies for killing people who don't like us. Um, and we've heard just a little bit about possibly our behavior might have something to do with why they don't like us. Is there a possibility for us to embrace a multipolar world stop throwing our weight around, stop demanding rules to try to keep the U.S. in the lead and on top and controlling things, will we be capable of operating 
in the multipolar world, which is a fact on the ground, and we are not, frankly, successful enough to uh, change it. Rock, you've been taught, you talked a little bit about a different take on that, which is we don't get to set the rules. So maybe sometimes rules preserve the interests of others. How about uh, um, following up in that direction? I think the sentiment of the question is, is, is accurate. The multipolar world is a fact. It's not something that you can roll up and reverse. And even when we try to set global rules uh, in terms of uh, those international institutions, they also suffer from a great deal of inertia and, 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 and to, to a very wide extent, ineffectiveness. And even as we may be able to sustain leadership through certain institutions, there is also new institutions coming up where we're not necessarily the leaders. So again, I mentioned earlier the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the East Asian community. Um, and you have linkages across regional groupings in which we don't really have a role. Again, one of the under-analyzed uh, aspects of, of diplomacy today is looking at inter-regional relations. It's when Latin America and the Arab countries have a summit. It's when China and, Af and, and African countries have a summit. It's when Europe and Asia have a summit. And there's tons of deals and, and, and agreements that go on there. And they make their own rules on how they're going to deal with each other. And we wouldn't call it global. It's not the World Trade Organization. It's not the IMF. But it's every bit as important because they are, from the bottom up, rewriting some of these rules on a regional, uh, regional level. Well, there's another set of issues here. And Stuart or, or Corey, either one of you address it. But I, you know, I, I sort of do believe we are sort of at that present at the creation 2.0 moment simply because we have two kinds of institutions in this world, you know, dysfunctional ones or you know, ineffective ones. And uh, you know, within the context of those institutions, they some and they overlap a lot. But um, we, you know, we've got within the with, within the context, uh, we either have to reinvent them, or we have to create new ones. And the Security Council needs it. The UN needs it. The WTO needs it. The IMF needs it. Uh, there is no climate agreement. Uh, we, you know, we, the uh, NPT. Uh, you know, we sort of need NPT 2.0. NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, isn't working, and so forth. So. Doesn't that create a, a, a great moment of opportunity to refashion a set of more balanced, perhaps, rules? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, to pick up on Rich's question, I had some sympathy with, um, with the notion that um, it, this simply shouldn't be the US throwing its weight around, et cetera. And, and, but the, on, on the issue of are rules, new rules, necessary, I think there's no question. And I think it is, there is a moment of opportunity here. There are rules. You know, we, we do face new challenges that require new rules. We do need rules, just to take the, uh, the uh, struggle against terrorism, for instance, we do need rules about how to treat uh, folks who are not full-on combatants uh, but aren't necessarily private citizens. We do need rules about uh, whether or not drone strikes are permissible. Um, looking in other areas, we, we need rules about what is the balance between uh, uh, those who have been historically responsible uh, for um, uh, global greenhouse gas emissions versus, uh, versus those who are increasingly becoming responsible for them. We need new rules on investment around the world, et cetera. So there is an element, uh, there's, there's certainly on the demand side, there's a need for new rules. Now on the question of whether or not the U.S. should be throwing its weight around, you know, I think that there's a, there's a, a major debate that needs to occur as to whether or not the pursuit of primacy U.S. hegemony should continue to be um, the, the basically the, uh, the the core aspect of, of U.S. foreign policy, and I think that adjusting to this multipolar world will be very hard psychologically for the United States. Which administration did you serve in? I served in the Bush administration. I yeah, make right. that clear to everybody. No, okay. But uh, I think that. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a major question as to whether or not it's going to require psychological uh, adjustment on the part of the United States. And part of it will be, you know, how, how do we coordinate um, cooperation amongst countries that aren't necessarily like-minded always and don't always have the same regime type uh, that we have? Because we need to cooperate and sit, be able to sit down and get a modus vivendi with the Chinese, even though we're at loggerheads on a number of different issues. We've got 10 or 15 minutes. I see two people over here. I just want to make sure everybody knows what, how much time we've got. Two? No, no. We were told we had we had we had ten more minutes. D do we? Yeah, yes. Yes. There you go. Are you? If you want us to finish early, we're happy to do it. No. Good. Okay. Good morning, Charlie McGowan from Sonoma County. Um, you were, there was some discussion. I think Dr. Sh Dr. Patrick mentioned 
the idea that uh, there's going to be, with the new Congress, there's going to be intense pressure to pull back internationally. And it seems to me that um, given the new Congress, that the pressure will be at both at the uh, State Department level and perhaps in the foreign uh, assistance level. Do you also anticipate that there's going to be more pressure to withdraw from Afghanistan and from Iraq more quickly than the Obama administration intends to? I grew up in a desi little cow town in Sonoma County. Um, I'll take the first whack at that. It seems to me more likely that the that the expansion of Republican representation in the House will give the President more time on the clock for Afghanistan. Um, I think he has written off Iraq, so I don't think that timeline is going to change significantly, although I believe it should. So, so no, I don't think there will be pressure on the President to wrap up the wars more quickly than he has. I do think there will be pressure on foreign assistance. Um, and this links to the, to the earlier question, which I'd uh, like to take a quick stab at. It does seem to me that you characterize American power in the international order principally as a function of the use of military force. And I think that's actually a much too narrow way to think about it. The American order, such as it has existed for much of the last 60 or 70 years, is a small L liberal order. It's an order about um, free markets, uh, prosperity, representative government, um, a sort of burgeoning cultural innovation. That's actually the basis both of our power domestically and internationally and the order. And one more thing about that, it is voluntary. We mostly don't force it. We don't force the French to go to McDonald's. We don't, for the most part, force people to opt into the American order. One thing that most countries realize is that it's quite difficult to be prosperous outside the American order. And the voluntary opt-in, rather the enforcement of it, is what makes American power more sustainable and more cost-effective in the international order than others. I think that's changing, by the way. Um, and, and, and we may want to we may want to talk about that a bit. But with regard to the last question, just let me throw in my own two cents. I don't think the president of the United States needs any additional impetus from the Republican Congress to want to get out of Afghanistan quickly. And I th I think 2012 will be plenty of impetus. And I think that you will see the pace continue um, uh, roughly as it has been as a consequence of that. I'm going to go here. Is there actually a microphone in that stand? Oh, okay. All right, fine. Go ahead. I'm Karen Wilson, first, from Western Massachusetts World Affairs Council. And I uh, just want to correct one thing. I've been with the World Affairs Council for seven years and attended all day yesterday. I never once heard one speaker talk about killing someone who doesn't agree with us. just want to make sure that that's been stated. <laughs> the World Affairs Council. All right, now I got a tough question for the four of you, and I'm going to make you do this. We've been challenged to come up with a two-year program of structured debate on the six most important issues of national security. Would you please put those in order for us? What? In order. What are the top... Uh, wait a minute, I get my question. What are the top six... The top six issues of national security in order because this important group has the ability to take this to our country. Pick two. Uh, energy security. Um, uh, financial stability. Pick two. Uh, nuclear proliferation and um, climate change. Managing rising powers and... <clears throat> You can't, you can't, pick two other ones. <laughs> I, said, I said energy security and financial stability. I said uh, nuclear proliferation and um, climate change. Managing rising powers and cost effectiveness of our strategies. All right. And in terms of importance of those, in terms of domestic importance, it's going to be economic stability, and we're going to view foreign policy through the lens of its impact on our economy for the next couple of years more than any other single factor. So you should take that as a lens. In terms of real security implications, it's probably either a, uh, uh, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, because that poses 
proximate threat of the greatest nature, or alternatively, the subject of this panel, which is how do you cope with a multipolar world, uh, what kind of structure you need to do it, um, and, uh, and, and what kind of diplomacy. I think one of the really interesting dimensions of going into a multipolar world is that diplomacy, that whole big building down in Foggy Bottom there that you may have visited, um, which has sort of drifted away from the center of American foreign policy for several decades, has got to come back into the middle. Because if you've got to deal with eight or nine or ten powers, diplomacy is the way you're going to do it, and we've got to learn how to repractice that art. So that, I think, may color what you've got. Great point. Next. Delve a little bit more into what Rich said, but it's in keeping with what we're talking about here. I see a disconnect um, very much at the center of what the Secretary uh, was talking about today was the focus that the world accepts American leadership, that American leadership has to be at the core of if anything happens. And yet we've, what we've been hearing here is that that may not necessarily be the case, that there is a rejection sometimes or a not needing American leadership. We also, I also remember a recent Gallup poll that said that young Europeans are not necessarily even looking to uh, the United States as, as the leader of the free world. So with that being said, how would you have changed the priorities that the Secretary issued today for dealing with this new world. What would be different if Americans had to be one of equals rather than number one? Okay, we've got to wrap up. So each one of you take the answer of that and with 60 seconds, and, and if you don't know what the Secretary said and that's an impediment to you, you don't belong in Washington. <laughs> um, uh, <okay. laughs> um, However, deferring to Corey is a slick move. <laughs> um, uh, so, 60 seconds each and then we'll wrap it up. I will start by saying that I disagree with the, the premise of the question. It, That's good. It, yeah, good. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but, by I, the way, by the way, but I have a substitute. The, 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 answer, the approach you take then is to answer the question you wanted to answer anyway. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Which is that if you look at the countries that want close relationships with the United States, they are countries that have worries that they want our help with and problems they want solved. That 20-year-old Western Europeans don't feel in particular need of American friendship and amity and involvement is, I think, less a judgment on us than the happy judgment that they don't feel like they have that many problems they need our help with. If you look at the, the countries that are pulling in closer relationships with the United States in the last couple of years, Asian countries that are worried about China's rise, the countries of the Gulf and other parts of the Middle East who are worried about Iran's behavior. So I think it correlates less with uh, is the United States, um, well, I, I would recharacterize the question that when countries have problems, um, America still feels extraordinarily powerful to them. And I think that's the way I would answer your question. Okay. Uh, just on the question of American leadership and, and um, what the Secretary um, said, and the, it's very difficult for a sitting U.S. official in charge of U.S. foreign policy not to suggest that the United States should somehow be a global leader. That would be uh, a very short tenure for that person. <laughs> so notwithstanding that realism, I think, uh, excuse me, notwithstanding that sort of ideological context that is bipartisan that we live in, uh, I think that um, uh, the administration would be wise to think about ways of, of, of coming up with a concept of collective leadership um, that takes, uh, as Parag began to intimate, um, that takes as its point of departure what other countries, how they actually see the world and tries to come up with strategies to actually find some common ground or concert on particular issue areas. I think you're going to find a much, rather than everyone signing up hook, line, and sinker to U.S. preferences across a wide range of the global agenda, I think you're going to find a modular approach to international cooperation increasingly. It's not going to happen just through international institutions, but as I think this administration has begun to recognize, and I've heard Jim Steinberg speak about this in other times, um, the, 
th an appreciation that there will be different formats and different frameworks to try to handle some of these issues, uh, not just the United Nations, but sort of more smaller group coalitions. So that's the way I would, I would uh, like to see them correct things. Last 60 seconds. I think the premise of your question that uh, each country views itself as the center of its own world rather than as deferring immediately to the United States is accurate, and I think that's increasingly the case. Um, their first priority is not necessarily to have the best relations with the United States, but to gain the maximum advantage from whatever relations they do have uh, with the United States for their own benefit. And the corollary to that is uh, what I call multi-alignment. Uh, because if the world is as you describe it, which is that uh, powers see themselves as relatively equal, no one above the others, that means that they are going to, uh, to multi-align. They will have get some benefits from the United States, get whatever they can from the Europeans, deal as well with the Chinese, and so forth. And these may be contradictory and very fluid sorts of relationships, but that's exactly what we're seeing emerging uh, out of, uh, if you analyze the foreign policies of uh, countries like Brazil or India uh, or Russia, you see this uh, playing all sides as much as possible because they know that they can get away with it and that whatever the United States can do to punish them is not sufficient to make them uh, change this multi-alignment behavior. At the end of the day, it's going to be this fluid environment which uh, we can't really assume that alliances are so sacrosanct. Uh, the, the difference between the word alliance and dalliance is just one letter. <laughs> All right. On, on, that, on, that, on that note, l let me conclude by saying this. We, we posed a question about whether there's a new system and a new set of rules. And I think while there was some disagreement about the nature of the system and some disagreement about the nature of the rules, we are clearly in a period of transition. We are clearly in a period of substantial change. The old approaches of the United States, the old approaches of great powers no longer apply. The old formulas don't apply. The old institutions need to be changed. And what is exciting, except Corey disagrees with that. But, um, it, but, but I was about to offer a compliment to you and everybody else, so keep quiet. <laughs> Um, the, 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 and the, the, the way that we are going to cope with those changes is with new thinking and not the same old people saying the same old stuff. And you guys, with all of your World Affairs Councils, have a great opportunity in getting new voices like these guys and listening to those new voices because they're the ones who are going to be the architects of these changes, or in Corey's case, the architects of this lack of change. Uh, but, in any, but, but in any event, that's the future, and that's why listening to a panel like this is so interesting. Thanks very much for taking the time.